So um, it's been hard to kind of talk about it on here because, you know, there's probably not that much of an audience for it, but I think United are going through enough of an issue as it is at the moment for me to kind of, you know, put my neck out there and, you know, speak about some of the things that I think I've gone wrong in our team. And I don't think I've even put my neck out. I'm just speak, I'm just stating the obvious that other people have kind of mentioned, but I thought I'd just give my little two cents on it. So, um, as you're well aware, my United are going through a very, very difficult moment at the, at the well, we're going through a difficult period um, of, you know, form and the results since, um, probably since Alex Ferguson unfortunately caught his time on his career. We haven't seemed to, we haven't seemed to be, we haven't seemed to get the, oh, you know, the, we haven't seemed to get the managers right. We don't seem to get the recruitment right. We haven't seemed to be able to do anything right outside of the commercial aspects of our club. And it's finally starting to kind of, you know, um, rear its ugly head again. And we've finally started to kind of hit a bit of a slump where a lot of the fans, a lot of the pundits, a lot of the media are starting to realise that we're, we're in a real, real, real big mess, right? And it's been compounded, obviously, with our poor result away from home against Newcastle, a team that are suffering probably as much as us, if not worse, who are run by a very incompetent um, owner in Mike Ashley, who's kind of essentially got rid of one of their best managers they've had in the last maybe decade in Rafa Benitez, in, you know, in the hopes of maybe saving money, and hired Steve Bruce, who's kind of had a bit of a, you know, pretty average career as of late in the Premier League um, and he somehow managed to uh, nick a result and I wouldn't even say nick a result I think Newcastle were well deserved of the victory right I think they probably had a bit more of the brighter play they were probably a bit more inventive if not you know a bit more laborious they had players who are hungry and really wanted to show out and as you know whenever Man United come to town especially away from home the teams that we're facing are always really up for it because Man United is a big scalp right we're a big team we won a lot of trophies back in the day people get a lot of satisfaction out of beating us so unfortunately the players that we have at the moment don't seem to be able to handle that kind of pressure so whenever that kind of pressure gets put on top of them and we don't score we inevitably end up losing and um, yeah, I'm just putting up here just the, our past results just to kind of give you a bit of an idea of just how bad things are getting for Man United. But these are our past results, right? So from the 23rd, 22nd of September, we lost 2-0 um, to West Ham. Um, then we went to the, we played the League Cup game against Rochdale and we just, we, we drew the game 1-1 and we won on penalties only. Then we drew 1-1 against Arsenal, which was a tight game, to say the least. I think Arsenal were probably as worse, if not worse, than us in that game. But they had a Pierre uh, Emerick Aubameyang, who happens to be probably the best striker out outside of the top three or outside of the top two, right? So I think if if Arsenal are able to finish third, it will be because of Aubameyang and their other strikers like Lacazette. Like if Nicolas Pepe decides to kind of come into form, if they end up playing um, Martinelli a few times in the league, that's when that's probably why they'll finish third or fourth, right? Because they've got better firepower than the other teams. Um, that was a pretty poor game overall in terms of quality. Then we went to play the Europa League game against Azad Alkmaar on the very different difficult pitch don't get me wrong but still we were probably outplayed for large periods of that game even though we controlled the game quote unquote the whole controlling the game thing i don't really buy because you know if you're not really doing anything with the ball when you have it it's not really controlling the game the same sort of thing happened when we had van gaal as coach we had large belts we had large periods of possession we controlled the ball but we didn't really control the actual game um and then we came back of course from az alkmaar away from home against newcastle and we just essentially um cocked it up right we completely messed up the situation and now we're in a position where we're in a, a bit of a faux relegation battle we're probably not going to get relegated because you know there's no way we're going to be worse than some of the other shit teams in the league but it's just an interesting place to be in and see how far the team has fallen but it's also interesting just to view it from the outside perspective because i think i am probably one of a few or if not one of a small number of united fans out there that doesn't actually think we're as bad as the results say we are I think even with the departures of Herrera, of Fellaini, of Lukaku, of Alexis Sanchez, um, and some of the recruitment that's come in has been a bit suspect, right? I still think with an actual fit squad of 23 players, right, and an actual competent manager who can actually get the best out of them, I still think that team is more than adequate or is more than good enough, right, to nick a result or to finish in the top six or in the top four of the league. I think so. I don't think the Premier League is as good or as competitive as some people like to make it think as. I think it's maybe in the top six. There's a lot of competition there and they can kind of, you know, there's much of muchness. But I think apart from Man City and Liverpool, the rest of the league is kind of very interchangeable. There will be, you wouldn't be shocked and surprised if, you know, a big team, a quote-unquote big team happened to get relegated this season because everyone's sort of like, you know, there and thereabouts. Um, so I think if we had an actual good manager in place, we could actually do proper bits. But I think the actual thing that's wrong with our club is that throughout this whole, you know, period of 
you know, failure after failure with managers, you know, with scouting, with player recruitment. The one thing that's really stuck out or that's really kind of been obvious to some of the outside people looking at it is that Man United really need a sporting director to come in, a football director, someone to come and actually orchestrate our overall long-term vision, right? Our long-term plan. Um, sporting directors and football directors in the UK were something that was resisted for a long, long time, right? I think a lot of it came down to the whole, you know, working class, maybe kind of uh, simplistic view on football. Like it's not too difficult. You're just kicking the ball around, you know, run, um, fitness, passion, uh, man just shouting on the sidelines, that kind of era of football where, you know, um, a lot of the fans were kind of, you know, wanting managers to be jumping up and down on the sidelines, wanting their players to be rushing into players and all that sort of like kick and rush football. That probably breeded a lot of the contempt that came with the whole football director, right? It was like, oh, what, what is that? What is he or she really going to do that's going to be any different from what the manager can do, right? But as the football, as football has become more of a global game, especially the Premier League, is you know, has got a really big reach outside of the UK, and loads of money being poured into it. The demands of a football club or the demands of a manager are being stretched way, way too thin, right? And the club has a lot riding on it. So you know, if you're if you get promoted to the Premier League, you get a big purse. If you get relegated, you get a big parachute payment. But there's a lot on the line for clubs to survive and to strive to survive and strive in the Premier League. You know, a lot of people's futures and employment is really riding on that, right? Away from the players, some of the kind of supporting staff, some of the people that work in the team room, the kit guy. A lot of a lot of it rides on the success of the team. So the club and the chairman or the people involved in the in the situation overall with the long-term health of the club can't really risk just having all the responsibility placed on the manager. So that's why football directors and technical directors come in, right? Because they're able to spec out the entire plan, a kind of long-term plan of the club. Sometimes it's not going to work out because, you know, football is a fickle, it's a fickle game. Things change very quickly, but there's a blueprint in place so that even if the elements of the, of the team change, you can still kind of carry on in the same sort of direction, right? It's the same way how, you know, you look at clubs like Barcelona, you look at clubs like Ajax, you look at clubs like, Maybe not Real Madrid, but um, you look at some of the more footballing based technical, like maybe Arsenal is a good example. Maybe Tottenham now after Pochino would be a good example. You're going to see a very common pattern on the kind of managers they get in after the said managers leave or they get sacked. They won't be such a, I think we're the only team so far in the top six or in the, maybe the top leagues in the in the Europe in Europe so far that goes from such big swings in the managers that we hire, right? There's no real rhyme or reason why you should go from, Moyes to Van Gaal to Van Gaal to Mourinho to Mourinho to Solskjaer. They don't really, they, there's nothing that ties them together um, in terms of philosophy and how, how they play and recruitment, the approach to team building, transfers, nothing is there that's, that's a common theme. So what ends up happening is that you end up doing what we used to do back in the day or what Chelsea even did back in the day, where you end up just sacking managers, starting again, giving that new manager a big purse, hopefully, and then giving him kind of a, a year and a half window to, you know, to show you something. And if he does reinvest it again and keep building, right? But of course, that costs, that, that costs a lot of money. Um, it's not necessarily a foolproof way. And it's just not a sustainable way to kind of run a football club. So a technical director was something that has been crying out away from all the, you know, the things that we have a problem with in United, whether it's the fact that we still have Ashley Young playing for us, the fact that Phil Jones got a new contract, Smalling got a new contract before he left, the fact that we're playing half of Alexis Sanchez's transfer, Alexis Sanchez's, Alexis Sanchez's um, weekly wage story whilst he's at Inter, the fact that we let go of Lukaku without bringing a replacement, the fact that we let go of two international players in terms of Flaney and Herrera and they replace them. The, all that aside, the thing that I was really crying out for was a technical director because technical director would have sorted out all those issues. He would have been able to earmark, he would have been able to see the players who don't fit into our long-term objectives and not been able to offer them a contract, right? And just got them out and kind of got other players in, youth players able to replace them or whatever it may be. But the fact that we, do, we haven't got it has been something that's really baffled me over the years. And so far from Ed Woodward, we haven't heard anything that's kind of gave us the assumption that we're going to get technical director in director we've kind of you know they kind of keep saying they're assessing it and they're still interviewing which it doesn't make any sense how long the interviews are going to go on for but that's the one thing that's been crying out for me in terms of a, in terms of a, a solution to this issue because i think right now i think most united fans are wise enough to know that if we sack Oligan and social now we can probably go out and get a better manager but i'm not necessarily confident or assured that the current regime can identify who a better manager is because I know they're going to... Nothing that we do has been cute, has been strategic, has been a bit clever. Everything has been obvious, for, even from our signings, right? Even Juan Bissaka, Fred, not Fred, um, Maguire. Um, these players, they, they're, they're the obvious choices. We don't, necessarily need, we don't necessarily need that. What we need is a, a vision, 
and an idea to pluck maybe a manager who not necessarily someone that people are familiar with maybe to kind of be able to build our long-term goal or long-term future over a number of seasons and maybe a coach that can improve the players we have at the moment because we know we have to we know we're stuck with some of those guys for the foreseeable future and then what kind of made this more evident after the back of you know poor results was this great article that came out on Sky Sports News just recently now um, where they profiled this uh, football director called Luis Campos right who's worked with Monaco and Seville and a few other places and he's kind of Jose Mourinho's kind of best friends and somebody who one of the only few people who Mourinho kind of stayed in contact with post getting fired from Real Madrid right that was kind of everyone said Real Madrid was one of the big moments that kind of changed Marino's kind of trajectory right where he kind of finally maybe started to realize that maybe his shit does stink right and he's not necessarily the god's gift to managing and he kind of maybe started to doubt his abilities or maybe it seemed as if the game had caught up to him and he was kind of getting left behind in terms, in terms of his transfers and in terms of his strategy in terms of his formations and tactics blah 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 but Luis Campos was one of the only people that kind of you know kept a good relationship a good rapport with him um, which kind of maybe do you think, you know, why wouldn't they get Luis Campos in when Mourinho was around to kind of appease him and to kind of maybe settle him down a bit? We don't know. The club is a, made, made up of a mess anyway in general. But there's a really good article here on, on Sky Sports News that I'm going to read out quickly that kind of spe- any where Luis Campos essentially specifies why a football director is so important and why Man United should get one, right? Let's get one here on the screen. So basically, here, here's, a, here's an article. It says here, why may not need a sporting director. Luis Campos on those Mourinho's Old Trafford struggles. This is from the Sky Sports News website. It says here the following. Uh, Manchester United desperately need a sporting director to balance the sport inside with the economic side of the club. That is the opinion of Jose Mourinho's close friend and former colleague, Luis Campos, sporting director of French club Lille. It's been reported that United are looking for a sporting director, but are yet to make an appointment with a club 12th in the Premier League and with just one <laughs> top three finish since Ferguson left the club. So that one top three finish was when Mourinho finished second that season when he was saying it was a good result and everyone was kind of laughing at him for saying that, which, you know, in retrospect, he was, he was right. Um... Campos, who was an assistant um, to former United manager Mourinho at Old Trafford, I mean at Real Madrid, um, believes his difficulties at Old Trafford centred around the lack of support for a sporting director. In the scripted interview with Sports News, Campos said the following, I speak to Jose every week, sometimes every day. I saw that Jose, in my opinion, had difficulties in Manchester United because the club has another culture, which I respect, of course. If the coach is alone, he is an easy target and he needs help. Everyone needs help in football. You can't play alone. Manchester United is an amazing club with amazing history. And for people around the world, it's difficult to understand what's happened to this club. It's difficult to see this club in difficulty. But it's diff- But if it's di- if this difficulty is arriving, it's because you have one problem. In my opinion, the problem is sensibility. It's important to work together, supporting the, with sporting with economy. If you don't put these things together, I believe you are heading for disaster. Of course. And it's exactly where we are. Um, I know very well the situation of Manchester United and other clubs. But in my opinion, everybody needs a sporting director because the coach needs time to prepare the next match and the super ego the players too so you need people with sensibility if a coach is alone it's more difficult so essentially what he's saying is that coaches need help nowadays so the the era of the arson wengers and the alex ferguson's the kind of um one man kind of you know one man kind of running machine that ran the club from top to bottom that was able to secure sponsorship able to lend a hand in terms of how the club the design of the stadium looked and seating plans and the way the box the, the vip boxes look um co- commenting on the fucking grass all that malarkey doesn't happen anymore you need a coach that's specifically going to be a coach that's going to be able to manage that team manage his ego sort out the formation the tactics whatever it may be doing behind the scenes get that sort of done so that the sporting director can go out and identify players there's a story that i heard recently that this Luis campos got awarded the most frequent flyer miles for some airline only in a, in a year period because he'd been flying so much around the world visiting um, different clubs and watching people play personally one-on-one so imagine the kind of insights that he's kind of gleaned from doing that over a number of years and imagine that person being plugged into a club and specking out a long-term vision and then kind of running that against with the manager that they've got in place so that even if that manager doesn't work out you can replace with somebody else and it still kind of keeps ticking away whereas what we have at the moment is the kind of archaic old school method where as soon as the manager leaves we're back to square one again. We have to start all the way from the beginning. There's no kind of rhyme or reason why we're going after said player. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, the article continues here. Mm-mm-mm. Let's get up on here. Article continues. There's a following. A sporting director is very important. Of course, I believe I could help Manchester United, but I respect the process of the club. It's very prestigious, very, very prestigious. But in modern football, you need a sporting director if your sporting director has sensibilities. And this is campuses, and this is a list of campuses uh, players that he's able to like bring through, right? 
He brought through Kylian Mbappe, Nicolas Pepe, Thomas Lemaire, James Rodriguez, Anthony Martial, Benjamin Mehdi, Fabiano, Brennan, Brennan, Bernardo Silva, and uh, Bakayoko. And the, the interesting thing is, especially with United, especially with the fact that, you know, Ed Woodward and the club seem so hell-bent on making sure that we are a financially profitable club and all that malarkey, is that you sometimes think, if they were if they were that worried about money, why wouldn't they want to see us play well on the pitch? Why wouldn't they want to be us to be successful? Why wouldn't they want to do everything in, a, in, our, in their power to ensure that the club runs smoothly so that the money just keeps pouring in and they can and the games can keep, keep taking more money in the club? Why wouldn't they do that? Why would they continue doing such a haphazard approach to it and relying on just the sponsorship money and the things coming through from league finishes to kind of sustain the club? Because they could get much more money by us finishing a certain level, a certain position in the league. I think we've got 83 million just for finishing, just for qualifying, just for getting to the quarterfinals of the Champions League sort of thing. That is probably more sustainable or more of a, that's probably better, a better cash grab than waiting for us to, I don't know, flukily win the Europa League or FA Cup or something. That seems makes more sense, doesn't it? And if you did something like this as well, and got sporting director in place, he could essentially bring in players for a low fee and then essentially over a long period of time, especially if they're foreign players who might have um, aspirations of playing for Barcelona, PSG, Rome, you don't have a lucky, you could then sell them on for huge, huge, huge profits down there and down the line because you don't really need to sell them because you're United, you make a lot of money. So if people do want to buy them off you, they'd have to pay over the odds for it. So by and large, that method will always give them money. But this way, how is, how is signing Smalling and Young or Jones and all these guys that matter onto extra onto long onto bonus contract going to make them any more money. It's going to cost them money because we're going to have to get rid of these players on loss. It's costing us money to keep Marcus Rojo around because he's never plays or he's not good enough for to play for us. And other clubs don't want to take him because he's on ridiculous wages at United. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sort of sense, and that's why sometimes I wonder. Everyone always says Ed Woodward's a really good commercial manager and you know he's able to like do all the good business but how really good is he really in the retrospect like how good is this guy really he's been he's been at the helm overseeing four failed managers so far and he hasn't been his job hasn't been called into question at all even once i don't understand that managers keep getting rotated players keep getting you know kicked out or booed out of the club but so far so but for so far it would never happened to him he's been kind of left alone in that regard that's been the odd one Anyway, it continues. Uh, before the coach did everything, uh, but now the information is arriving very fast. Now the world is very different. You need to know players in every part of the world. It's important the club has one project with a sporting director. Everyone understands where they go. You need one person with sensibility for the sporting director for the sporting and current situation. In modern football, you need both to work together. If you don't work together, it's a disaster. So you need the, the economics, the business side of football, and the football on the pitch to work hand in hand. You can't just have this club, not like you know American football clubs, where it's just run completely on the commercial side. They don't really give any hoot about what's going on in the field because for the most part, clubs don't get relegated. There's no real cost to you finishing bottom of the league or whatever. But in football, there is, right? You could essentially go down all the way down the rungs of football if you don't kind of get the things on the pitch right, as, as well as the stuff that's going on the commercial side of it. But, you know, what do I know? Campos 55 has been a sporting director at Lille since 2017, helping him to return Champions League and having helped unearth some of the Europe's best talent. His CV is quite something. He's found and sold talent in excess of 500 million. I'll see if he would consider being Twitter to, uh, to Mourinho's next pro project. He said the answer was clear. Of course, the Portuguese said, uh, Mourinho is like a brother to me. I know him very well for a long time. He's a wonderful person and the best coach in the world. So, of course, if he called me, I would speak. In my opinion, football needs someone like Jose. Football needs this special coach, his energy, such strong personality. I believe the next work of Jose will be his top work. So, again, a very good observation, summation from... Um, from this guy in terms of speaking about why as a sport director is so necessary and why we should probably go out and get one whether or not that's going to happen is another subject for another day i don't think it is going to happen i don't think the club actually wants to do that i think in general they would rather they rather just try and get it right with a manager because i think when you get sport director involved it might necessarily undermine the power and influence someone Edward Wood has in the club which is again is um a negative on our part in terms of fans but 
if we do want to get somewhere, I don't think United fans should waste their time trying to throw pedals at Solskjaer because, you know, we knew it was a dud from the beginning. We were all kind of hoping it wouldn't be a dud because, you know, we have a sentimental place in our heart for him, for what he's done for the club. But we knew he was going to be a dud from his CV. He's, he's shown nothing so far that's proved us otherwise, apart from that little short run when he came into him boss. He got given a permanent job way too hastily, in my opinion. And now we're kind of reaping the, reaping the rewards of it. But I think long-term wise, what we do need is a strong um, character to come in as sporting director, as technical director, to kind of steer that ship, take the responsibility of the football side of things away from Ed Woodward, push him outside of the room and let the football people do the football things. And then slowly but surely, you'll see us return back to the top. And I don't think it will take that long. Honestly, I don't think the club or the team is as bad as some people make it out to be. I think the squad, especially with some of the players that Solskjaer has let go and some players he's moved on, I think those players are okay to finish in about the top four, top three maybe. At a push so if you get a technical director in and a competent manager and you have some good signings in the process of a couple of seasons you could slowly see us creeping up the league very very easily i don't think the league is as good people make out as it is going to be but again these are all topics that i hope will get sorted in the next couple of weeks we've got an international break coming up now maybe a bit of a breather the club will um, rectify the situation i know for sure if, if you know we end up losing heavily to liverpool that Sosha will probably end up losing his job. That's that's that goes without saying because I, I just don't think Edward's going to be able to handle that kind of pressure being heaped on him. Um, and looking at the fixtures now, we have who do we have? We have Liverpool next, right? Liverpool next. We have Liverpool next. Partizan Belgrade away from home, Europa League. Then Norwich away from home. Then Chelsea away from home. We have four away. F- we have basically four away from home games. We're playing away four times in the league. That is insane. Wow. Wow. Oh, well, four times. Two times away from home. Two times in the cup. Insane. So I don't really see us getting good results from that from that situation. So it's probably not going to end well for us. But you know, what can you do? What can you do? Bloody hell. Talking about Man United just makes me sad, innit? Just whenever I talk about United, I just feel sad. That's the fun I do. I just feel sad, 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 sad. sad. But you know, that is the nature of being a sporting fan. And I think I mentioned it prior before, but I do kind of feel sometimes a little bit. There is a part of me that's kind of happy that we're going through this bad time because we we got rid of all the silly glory hunter fans, right? That was probably the annoying part of being a United fan. We were winning everything. Probably City are probably suffering from the same things. All your Wally fans come out once you're doing well, right? All the worst fans you don't really want to be associated with are the ones kind of speaking up and talking. So once you're not successful, those fans who are only there for the good times tend to kind of, you know, hide or t- 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 tend to refrain from talking to too much in public. Um, but I don't know if I wanted this to last as long as I wanted it to, as, as this, you know. It's getting a little bit uncomfortable at the moment, but hopefully it changes.